bits and bytes. In this episode, we're going to look at the microcomputer in the workplace, where the two most widespread applications are word processing programs and the VisiCalc type of program, the electronic spreadsheet. What's an electronic spreadsheet? Sounds like a new sort of electric blanket. No, a spreadsheet is just a large worksheet with columns of numbers, and it's used for any kind of planning, whether you're planning your own personal budget or the finances of a small business. And this sort of thing can be done many times more quickly on a computer. Now, what's word processing? I'm not even sure I know exactly what that is either. Well, word processing is really a very fast and convenient way of composing and editing text. Let's have a look at a typical word processing program. There's one already set up on the IBM computer. Oh, yes. IBM personal computer. Insert storage diskette in drive B. Ah, oh, here we are. And then uh, press enter. Uh, where's enter? It's the large key with the arrow bent to the left. Oh, here we are. Ah, easy writer file system. Uh, edit a file. Do we have a file we can edit? Try Scrooge. Scrooge, all right. Uh, get a file. Press G and Scrooge. File in memory. Where is it? Type E for edit and you'll see it. Oh, there we are. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Have you got the whole of A Christmas Carol in here? Actually, we could have because the book is only about 100 pages long. So it would just about fit onto one floppy disk. But in this file, we only have a couple of pages. Well, how do I get to page two? Well, you know how to move the cursor to the bottom of the screen, don't you? Oh, are these the cursor keys? That's it. If you keep pressing the cursor key, the next page will start to appear. The text starts to move up. Or you could think of the screen as moving down. The screen is like a window or porthole through which you can see different parts of the whole scroll of text. If you want to go back to the beginning, just keep on moving the cursor up. Oh, yes. Now, if Charles Dickens had had a word processor, how would he have gone about doing some editing? The first thing you can do with a word processor is insert or delete letters or words. But I can do that on most computers without using a word processor. Yes, you can. But if you try to insert or delete whole sentences or paragraphs, you'll be in trouble. And yet that's very easy with a word processor. Suppose you want to insert a sentence after Marley was dead to begin with. All right. Move the cursor to the space in front of the word there. Okay. Now press the insert key. It's marked INS. Oh, I see. The line cursor has become a block cursor. And that means that you're now in the insert mode. Now just type in some new sentence. I'll type in, I think we should make that quite clear. I see. So the new sentence just pushes all the rest of the text along to make room for itself. And you could insert a whole paragraph. Then the entire page would move down. And to delete, what do I do? If you want to delete the same sentence, you position the cursor over the first letter. OK. And hold down the delete key, the one marked D-E-L. Oh. It's like shunting trains around. And I notice that it also automatically wraps your words around at the end of the line so that you can keep on typing in a continuous stream. And when you finish your typing, you can save it on a cassette or disc so that you can bring it back and change it whenever you want. So Dickens could have kept all his manuscripts on disc. Some writers are doing that nowadays or even delivering them straight to their publisher on disc. But the computer gives you several choices. If you have a modem, you can send your text along a telephone wire. Or, if you have a printer, you can print it. Well, I know how a modem works, but I've never actually used a printer. Press the key marked F10 to get back to the menu. 
Okay. And now press F2 to start printing Christmas Carol. This is really something. To stop the printer, press F7. Unbelievable. Oh, that's pretty simple, and it looks good. So a word processor is really the ultimate electronic typewriter. It's not so much an electronic typewriter as an electronic office. Let's compare an ordinary typewriter with a word processor, and you'll see the difference. When you come to think of it, an ordinary typewriter is a pretty limited device. You type in some words, and all it does is give you a paper copy. If you want to file the words, you need a second device a filing cabinet. If you want to send the words to someone else, you need another device, a mailbox. And if you want to rearrange the words, you need yet more devices, such as a pair of scissors and some glue for cutting and pasting. Now consider the word processor, which is really just a computer, plus a word processing program. You use the computer's keyboard to send your words into the computer's memory. And you use the computer's screen as a window on these words so that you can see what you're doing as you use the word processing program to cut and paste the words to your satisfaction. And then there are several things that you can do. You can file the words on one or more storage disks. You can print them on a printer. And you can pass them on to a modem to be sent to some other computer. This means that once you have a word processing system, you really have a self-contained little office with its own built-in typewriter, filing cabinet, mailbox, and scissors and glue, all rolled into one. So a word processor can be my own little office, and I can do all my rough drafts and rewrites on the computer screen itself. So it must save a lot of paper, too. But a word processor is more than just a way of saving paper by letting you correct text on the screen. Let me show you something else that it can do. There's a famous speech from Julius Caesar already on file. No, oh, good. I'm going to get a chance to edit Shakespeare. Okay, now type G. What's the name of the file? Caesar. Okay. The file is now in the computer. To see it, type E for edit. Okay. Ah, oh, yes, this is familiar. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Hamlet, not to praise him. Hamlet, wait, what's Hamlet doing here? We deliberately substituted Hamlet every time the name Caesar appears so that you could see how a command called search and replace works. This command is on another menu that you can call up by typing F4. F4? Type S for search and replace. Ah, oh, I see. Search for Hamlet, I guess. Okay, here we go. Search for Hamlet. Replace with Caesar. And all or some, all. Oh my gosh, look at that. What kept it? It's a busy little cursor, isn't it? You know, Shakespeare would have loved this. And I can see how it could be really useful. If I had a contract with a company and I wanted to rewrite the same contract with a second company, I could change the company name throughout the contract in a flash. And you'll find the search and replace feature on many word processing programs. There are slightly different versions available for most microcomputers. But there are a lot of other features that we haven't had time to look at. Text formatting, choosing different type styles, preparing form letters, and so on. Well, how long does it take to learn to use a word processing program properly? Well, you've already learned quite a bit in just a few minutes. And to master EasyWriter, which is a fairly elaborate word processor, only takes a few days. And you've seen that the printing part itself is very simple. Yes, that's true. And I notice that each letter is actually made up of dots. Yes. This type of printer builds up all the letters out of dots. It's the most popular kind of printer for small computers. It's called a dot matrix printer. But there are more expensive printers that will give you fully formed characters not made up of dots. 
The most popular printers that do this are called daisy wheel printers. There's one hooked up to the Xerox computer. The computer is all ready to print a memo. Just hit return. Tell me, why is it called a daisy wheel? Because it uses an element that's in the shape of a daisy. There's one on the counter near the disk drive. Oh, I see. It actually does look like a daisy, doesn't it? Has it finished printing now? Oh, yes, there's a big difference between fully formed characters and the dot matrix characters. And I can see that the fully formed ones look better for business letters. Yes, on the other hand, dot matrix printers can build up anything out of dots, different type styles or even pictures if you want. Well, I suppose it's the same principle as building up pictures on the screen with pixels. That's right. But to print really good line drawings, plans, diagrams, and so on, you'll want to use a different device, a plotter. A plotter? What's that? Let me show you some examples. On one of our visits to Hewlett Packard, we were given a demonstration of several different kinds of computer plotters. Plotters were very impressive. Yes, but of course they were designed to go with large computers. Although you can also get some modest plotters to go with most microcomputers. There's a tiny plotter you can get for the Radio Shack pocket computer. Oh, this really is small. Well, how do I get it to draw something? It's all ready to draw a little house. Just turn it on. Okay. Oh, I don't believe this. Look at that. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> well, isn't that nice? Thank you. The house that Billy drew. That's really something. So with a microcomputer, you can get to use some fairly elaborate word processors and even some ingenious little plotters. I suppose more and more people will be trading in their typewriters for this sort of equipment. Yes, I think it's inevitable. And one sign of the times is what's happening in education. Let's look at how they're teaching word processing as a skill in a high school in Scarborough, Ontario. We started word processing courses and working with word processing equipment at the high school level. 
and it was a small part of the course because we only had 10 machines and we moved them from school to school so the students would rotate through those machines and learn a little bit about word processing. Then as more money became available and we realized that word processing was becoming a very important part of the office, we decided that we should try to purchase machines that would remain in the school. Because we have six machines, we're able to give the students more time on the equipment. I would say that we're trying to incorporate word processing into our courses at the senior level to a very large extent. We don't want it to become an isolated part of the course. It has to be very much an integral part of their course and to give them the concepts behind word processing. This is a very simple machine to use. It's very user friendly. The speed of the word processor is far and above typing on an electric typewriter because you can make your corrections so very easily. You're going to get a perfect copy from a word processor. You can also print as many copies as you want and every recipient feels that he or she has received a personal letter. Some students take to working with equipment more easily than others and some students really take to it and become really hooked on it and want to learn more about it and they're certainly free to do that before and after school and it's fun it's exciting to see that student who finds hey this is really fascinating I'd like to learn more and I'm willing to spend my own time learning more about it and I think that's really what education is all about when you can just touch that little bit of interest and watch it grow in a student's classroom. Well, there seem to be some interesting changes taking place in education. But you were also going to tell me about these electronic spreadsheets, weren't you? Yes. We're going to look at VisiCalc, which is the most popular electronic spreadsheet of all. In fact, it's the world's best-selling microcomputer program. Pretty thick, isn't it? Yes, it takes a while to get used to the full capabilities of VisiCalc. But we can look at some simple examples. This version of the VisiCalc is especially designed for the IBM computer. But there are other versions available for virtually all the micros. To load the VisiCalc disk, hold down the control key and the key marked ALT, and press the delete key. Hmm. So this is what an electronic spreadsheet looks like. Well, this is what the top left-hand corner of an electronic spreadsheet looks like. The complete spreadsheet is much larger. I'll show you. There's a cursor. Do you see it? It's the green rectangle at the intersection of column A and row 1. Ah, uh, yes. Uh-huh. Move the cursor to the right by holding the right arrow key down. And if I keep holding down the cursor, oh, I see. It's a sort of window, like the word processor. Well, how far can I go? A long way. You can get back to position A1 by pressing home. Whew, that was fast. Now let's see what happens when I move the cursor down. You've got a long way to go yet before you get to the end. So this is really a giant spreadsheet. If you put it on one sheet of paper, the maximum width would be about two meters, and the maximum height about the same. Although you can't actually use both maximum values together, but you can get an awful lot of numbers on there. Very impressive. Well, let's go home again. Now, what am I going to do with this enormous worksheet? Well, let's suppose you're going to start a little business and that you want to predict your sales, costs, and profits for the next year. To save time, just put in the first three months as headings. Move the cursor to position B1 and type January. Okay. B1, January. Notice that what you type also appears at the top of the screen in what is called the edit line. And now I move to D1, and that would be March. Now, move the cursor to A3 and type sales. Okay, A3, sales. Then I'll come down to A5, and that will be costs. Okay. 
Now, let's say my sales in January were $1,000. Now, the costs, what are they likely to be? Well, let's assume that your monthly costs are 60% of sales. Let's have the computer calculate that. I can just type in 600. No, but think about it for a minute. If you went back and changed the 1,000, you'd have to change the 600, wouldn't you? So what do I do? You use a formula, and this is really the key to the power of VisiCalc, formulas. Well, what do I type in then? 60% uh, times 1,000? Close. Only we write 60% as a decimal fraction, 0.6. Okay, 0.6. Now, where's the multiplication sign? We use a special symbol for multiplication, an asterisk. Oh, okay. Now, 0.6 times 1,000? Well, it's more useful to say times whatever is at position B3, because it might change. Okay. Oh, I get it it's automatically worked out 60% of 1,000. Now, move the cursor up to B3. Okay. And type in some other figure for sales and watch what happens. All right, then let's pretend that my sales are, oh, 1,255.70. Whoa, this is tremendous. Oh, look at that. Now, I'll go back to my original 1,000. Now, don't get too carried away. There's some more work to do here. We must put in the formula for working out your profit. Don't tell me. Profit is sales minus costs, so I should type B3 minus B5, right? Yes, but there's just one thing. VisiCalc likes you to type plus B3 minus B5. Okay, uh, plus B3 minus... B5. Hey, that's really something. I understand how it works now. So VisiCalc lets you play with numbers in all sorts of ways. Now, what if my sales are such and such? What will my costs and my profits be? Yes, that's the advantage of VisiCalc. You can get answers to all sorts of what-if questions in a few seconds. We've got a typical household budget already on file. It'll give you some idea of the scope of VisiCalc. The instructions for calling it up are on the card beside you. Oh. Oh, here we are. Okay, so S L B colon. So income thirty thousand by weekly eleven hundred and fifty-three. Now after all expenses, the year end would be fifteen thousand four hundred and eleven fifty-six. Now if you just change one number, everything else will change. All right, let's say I have a very bad year and my income drops to, we'll say, 5,000. Oh, look at that. That's unbelievable. Now my year end is 2,358.42. But isn't it easy to lose track of what's going on? What if I forget how a particular number was calculated? In that case, you simply position the cursor over that number and look up at the edit line to see the formula that produced it. Okay, so cursor B5 is a bi-weekly income. So, the figure B5 is my annual income divided by 26. Well, that makes sense. You know, it would take hours and hours to work all this out with paper and pencil even if you used a calculator. Exactly. And since the electronic spreadsheet is such a powerful application of the microcomputer, let's have a closer look at it by seeing how it compares with an ordinary spreadsheet. Mr. Micawber once said something to this effect. Annual income, $100. Annual expenditure, $99. Result, happiness. Annual income, $100. Annual expenditure, $101. Result, misery. One way to predict our financial happiness or misery is to take a calculator, a pencil, and a spreadsheet and write the years along the top and our income, expenses, and profit down the side. If our expenses are 85% of our income, we use our calculator to work out what that comes to. 
and then use the calculator again to subtract expenses from income to give us our profit. If we expect our income to increase by 10% each year, we use our calculator once again to work that out, and then again to work out our expenses, and then yet again to work out our profit, and on and on until our fingers are numb. Now look at how it works with an electronic spreadsheet. We don't need a calculator at all because every one of the 16,000 or so little cells on the spreadsheet comes with its own built-in calculator. To work out income, expenses, and profit for the next 50 years, all we do is give a number to the first calculator, an instruction to the second, another instruction to the third, another to the fourth, and so on. And then we just sit back and watch as a whole army of tiny calculators works out our future happiness or misery in the twinkling of an eye. If only Mr. Micawber had had a computer. Well, I can see why VisiCalc is so popular. It's almost like a crystal ball that can tell your fortune in no time at all. I think I'll put my own numbers in here and see what happens. While Billy is asking his what-if questions, let me tell you about our next episode, which is called What Next? We've covered a lot of ground in this series, so our final episode will very briefly recap some of the main topics, and then through a number of documentaries, we'll extend these topics into the future. What will computer hardware and software look like in a few years' time? How does video text and teletext tie in with all this? How advanced will computer music and computer graphics become? Until next time, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. And I'm Billy Van. And I'm broke. <laughs>